The neighborhood of Brighton Beach is located at the southern tip of Brooklyn, New York, on the far end of the B train. While many other major U.S. cities have notable ethnic enclaves, your garden variety Chinatowns and Little Italy's, Brighton Beach is home to a thriving community of immigrants from Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and all over the former Soviet Union. As soon as you arrive in Brighton Beach, you're surrounded by Russian shops, Ukrainian faces, Georgian flags, and you no longer feel like you're just in regular old Brooklyn. Because you're not. You're in Little Odessa, a little stretch of the Black Sea coast on the Atlantic. The story of Little Odessa begins in 1974 with the passing of the Jackson Vanek Amendment a provision to a trade agreement between the USSR and the United States, which stipulated that Jewish refugees be allowed to emigrate from the USSR to the U.S. This resulted in a significant increase in Russian and Ukrainian Jewish immigrants, particularly to neighborhoods like Brighton Beach, which already had a large Jewish population. After David Hasselhoff brought down the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the subsequent fall of the Soviet Union, many more citizens from the former Soviet states made their way to Brighton Beach. Walking down the main drag of Brighton Beach Ave, you see Cyrillic letters on storefronts, Russian magazines at newspaper stands, Russian shops selling Russian pastries, and Russian people speaking Russian to their Russian friends. However, the Brighton Beach of today is more of a microcosm of cultures from the former USSR, all mixed together like a nice cold pot of borscht. With so many people from Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all the other stands, it's hard to describe Brighton Beach today as simply Russian. To continue the borscht metaphor, the Russians are simply the beets, while the Ukrainians are the cabbage, the Georgians are the potatoes, and I don't know about the rest. Let's move on. Speaking of food, Brighton Beach is a great place to sample some cuisines that will probably be unfamiliar to most Americans. My brother and I wound up eating right in the boardwalk at Tatiana Grill, where we started with a sweet cheese Vareniki, which is like a dumpling filled with cheese and covered in sugar. It was... Interesting, though the sweetness was less overwhelming when dipped in sour cream. We also ordered lemonade, but were told by our waiter that Russian lemonade was carbonated and more like a mix between Sprite and ginger ale. He then brought it out in a bottle that had a picture of a pear on it, which made sense because it tasted like pears instead of any of those other things. For our main courses, my brother ordered a chicken schnitzel, which isn't very Russian, but I don't make the rules here. I ordered the Pozhaski cutlet, which is apparently very popular in Russian cuisine and was a favorite dish of Tsar Nicholas I. And if it's good enough for a Tsar, it's good enough for me. The food at Tatiana was pretty good, but the best part was the cool breeze off the beach and being surrounded by Russian diners chatting with each other in their native language. It felt like we were relaxing at a beachside cafe in Moscow, if Moscow had a beach instead of the cold, unyielding Moskva River. The actual beach at Brighton Beach is pretty nice, by the way. Good for swimming. I guess that's probably what most people go to Brighton Beach for. They don't care about culture. They don't care about the borscht. After eating and drinking and swimming, you can go for a nighttime walk down Brighton Beach Ave, walking beneath the elevated train lines that run down the street. This may feel like the kind of ugly urban streetscape that most people would avoid, but I feel like the trains running overhead gives the neighborhood a gritty charm, like walking around a Russian-themed film noir. You'll see old Ruskies playing backgammon in front of shops, and packs of guys who look like henchmen sent to hunt down Steven Seagal going into nightclubs, and all sorts of things that'll make you forget that you're in the same city where they record Good Morning America every week. To cap off the evening, I would recommend a stroll down the boardwalk, where if you're lucky, you can catch a street performance of some Russian folk music by a couple of Jolly Ivans. <laughs> For me, this was the perfect way to end my visit to Little Odessa. Listening to burly men dressed like crewmen on a nuclear submarine play jaunty tunes under a streetlight in a language I can't understand. And honestly, isn't that what we're all looking for? The best part was that all the other people crowded around seemed to be locals who were just enjoying a little taste of the old country. 
This wasn't a performance for tourists to make their visit to Little Odessa feel more authentic. This was just for them, and we were lucky enough to be there. Also, this one Russian guy was absolutely pumped about every song and was just feeling the groove like a teen rolling on Molly at a rave. It was awesome. At one point a woman joined the one-man party and began doing her own probably Russian folk dance, but I don't think he noticed. It all made me so very happy. After nearly two years of various lockdowns and travel bans, it was nice to find a place where you can experience the wonders of international travel without needing a passport. That's the beauty of America. In such a melting pot nation as this, you can still find these little international pockets right in your own city. So if you ever find yourself in need of a cultural getaway but you can't get on a plane, consider looking in your own backyard. Find one of the neighborhoods where the old country still survives, no matter what the old country is, and take it all in. Eat the food, listen to the language, and dance, dance, dance the night away. Скучай, ты будешь до утра. У самого рая и моя ваша, ты хоть скучай, ты будешь до утра.